Well, I'm sure everyone watching this knows all about that ghastly Gillette ad about toxic masculinity, the best a man can be. I was so hopping mad when I saw that, and even crosser when I discovered it was produced by a, a film director from Australia. We have a special breed of feminists down under. But then came the response from Egard Watchers, What is a Man, which was just beautiful. And I'm really excited to be here today talking to the man who made that video, Ilan Sukovic. Hi, Ilan. Hey, how are you? Very good. I'm glad we finally managed to get this working. We've had a bit of a problem with our <laughs> Skype today. Um, yeah. And I've been wanting to talk to you ever since I saw that uh, wonderful video. But we, I think we'll, go, we'll start by going back to the Gillette ad and we'll show a few minutes of that just in case anyone watching this hasn't seen it. Um, but then I want, what, you, what I wanted you to do is tell me something about what prompted you to respond to that. What did you react to? Bullying. The Me Too the movement against sexual toxic harassment. masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't hide from it. It's been going on far too long. We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? What I actually think she's trying to say. Making the same old excuses. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. But something finally changed. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. But she says he's the problem. And there will be no going back. Because we, we believe in the best in men. Men need to hold other men accountable. Smile, sweetie. Come on. To say the right thing. To act the right way. Bro, not cool. Not cool. Um, the Gillette ad was the end of a series of things that kind of uh, got me to my end point, feeling that I needed to respond. Uh, you know, there was, uh, there's been kind of a, a narrative building over time and, uh, I didn't see it as helpful toward anyone, uh, not men, not women, not children. So, and it's, and it's specifically targeted men. Um, and I felt it was damaging and for a big company like Gillette, which is selling a men's product on top of everything such, and it's a masculine men's product. It's a shaving, it's a razor. It's, you know, it's, it's, I was just shocked that they would, uh, come out with such a generalizing uh, kind of commercial, uh, starting off with toxic masculinity as an issue and uh, showing only the worst in men. You know, if you're going to do something like that, they, they decided what's the worst things we can show in men. Let's only highlight this. Let's talk about toxic masculinity and then point the finger at all men and say, is this the best a man can be type thing. And, uh, mm. you know, I was just a little bit, uh, surprised that that's how far the narrative has gone. That it's become so mainstream that companies, genuinely feel like this is the profitable approach. Uh, but of course, it's, all, it's, it's absolutely to me about being made by a woman. It's so preachy about her version of what she thinks masculinity should be all about. Um, what really got to me was the little boys roughhousing and dad comes and to tell them that, you know, boys don't play like that. I mean, what the hell? This is a woman who clearly knows nothing about how boys re interact with each other. Well, not only that, those those behaviors are very healthy for kind yeah. of establishing uh, connections as a as a young male. I mean, it's totally normal. My brother yeah. and me were very rough with each other. It doesn't mean we love we didn't love each other. Didn't have the intention. The, the intention is not to hurt the other person. Yeah. It's a natural evolutionary biological thing. It's you see male animals doing it all the time to kind of test each other and grow. I'm very you know competitive sports are built on that very premise. And there's yeah, even a, yeah. an attack on competitive sports because of that very reason. Uh, yeah, the whole right, idea of right. competition is offensive now. So I mean, yeah, uh, I remember. I remember. I we used to. I used to work in my boys' school in a what we call tuck shop. You know, the school canteen. And I'd look out the, out the window, and there would be this line of supposedly, supposedly a line of boys, but they'd be all jumping on each other and shoving, and you know, stuff that boys do to each other. Yeah. And it was just so funny to watch them. They never stood still. They're always having a little jostle. Um, it was just fascinating to watch. Anyway, we look. So we actually better go back and say, tell us a little bit about you and how you got in a position to be able to make a video like that. And you actually running a, a watch company at the at, at the moment, and that's 
yeah. what, what got, how you got involved with all of this, yeah? Well, I founded the company as a, uh, a, I made my first watch for my father as a gift to him. I had a, a you know, I was a little bit of a rough kid. My dad never gave up on me. Um, <laughs> he's the one person who always believed in me and he kind of, and you know, that's, you want an example of healthy masculinity. That's the, exactly what it is. Without a father in my household, I wouldn't be here today. Yeah. Um, and that's a huge issue in society. So there's that element of it. I, I then got sick later on in life. My dad was there again, flew across. Across, to another country, across the country, from Canada to the other end of the United States, um, and took care of me uh, through everything. And uh, it was a really rough time, and again, he was there for me. So I said, at one point in my life, I'd love to do something special for him. He's older now, uh, and just do a tribute for him, and I made a watch for him. So the element of the importance of fathers, the importance of uh, bond, between a father and a son has always been, it's the inception of the company, it's the whole reason I do everything, to yeah. honor those kind of relationships, uh, to honor fatherhood. And so the, the brand has always been built on that. Oddly enough, even before the video, I had made razors because I felt like, but um, <laughs> straight cut razors, the type that barbers yeah. use, but a beautiful one. Just because I was like, you know what, no one's, it's kind of a throwback to being a gentleman and kind of getting in touch with the process of shaving against so I've always been I've always really cared about these things that connect me to masculinity connect yeah. me to kind of uh, ideals and um, so this you know the gel the Gillette ad initially I, I didn't I wasn't going to do it through my company I was uh, I was personally worried of backlash but everyone in, around me was really worried about backlash uh, including my father and we have you know celebrity partnerships we have all these contracts and one thing goes wrong and it can really cost my entire company's, my entire livelihood, you know, this is the thing I put all my money toward. Um, and so there's fear just because of the, how pervasive the narrative is nowadays. Yeah. Um, and I know somebody uh, else you were caught talking about that and you said the people were afraid it would draw attention away from the women's rights issues. I mean, for goodness sake, when will we say enough? Of women's rights and start talking about gender and equality between men and women. <laughs> anyway, I mean, I, I don't know. No, but I mean, it, yeah. It's interesting. That was one of the things that. Well, there was a couple things that I I got hit with uh, after making the video. Number one, there was the extreme, which uh, you know I didn't expect it to be that direct. But I obviously I got called a rape apologist. I got called. Uh, Join support, the club. Join supporting the club, all these. Yeah, so I didn't <laughs> yeah. take long, you know. Within the within a few hours of the video coming out, I started getting emails and comments, and I was like, you know what? The if there's no mention of women in my video, it's yeah. explicitly just highlighting the positive things men have done historically and how men have sacrificed a lot of things. Eli, uh, let's let's just show them a bit of the video now. It's called "What Is a Man," um, and. Um, I just want to make sure people are familiar with that. What is a man? Is a man brave? Is a man a hero? Is a man is a man a protector? Is a man vulnerable? Is a man disposable? Is a man broken? Is a man trying? We see the good in men.
So tell me what you th you thought you were doing there. Well, what I thought I was doing, what I've always believed, is that the way to affect positive change in the world is not to lecture people or tear people down, but to highlight the best in people. Yeah. And I believe we used to do that. Uh, we used to kind of have the, the thought process that it's, it's okay to celebrate masculinity, femininity. It's okay to celebrate, uh, you know, certain traditional values and, and not look down on them to such an extent. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm against everything else. It just means that I also want to draw attention to these things that men do great things in society and we can celebrate them. For yeah, but them. The, the amazing thing, of course, is Gillette used to do that, didn't they? It we did. Were looking, some of their 1950s ads were all about what, the wonderful things men did. <laughs> and the great irony is that they would get hijacked by the feminist narrative and think they have to then sneer at all of that. Anyway, I, I, when I first watched your video, I just had tears in my eyes. Tell me how you, I mean, you did put that all together in a night, is that right? You, you had yeah, all day. those, you, one day, you had all the images. How did you have that material available? And particularly the statistics. Well, I bought, I bought a lot of footage. Uh, I, I'm, a good, I'm, I'm a good editor, so I already uh, was able to do it myself in terms of technically. Uh, the statistics were things I already knew, but I, okay. I went and I went and I, I sourced everything just to be certain that everything was accurate. Um, and even, I mean, you want to talk the whole narrative of victim blaming, even within those narratives, uh, within those uh, statistics, what I was met with repeatedly was, oh, well, men choose to go die in war. Men choose <laughs> to commit suicide. Yeah, men sure. choose to take the, the terrible crap jobs that no one else wants to do. But to me, that's fine. If that's what you want to say, you're right. They do choose to take the hardest jobs. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't celebrate those people who are taking the hardest jobs. They're choosing. You're making my point. They aren't forced to do it, and yet they still go and do it. Uh, well, they so, may or may not be choosing. I mean, they're no, they may. They may have no choice because they need the big money to support their family. Yes. And the only way that they could do that is to work, go and work at a mining company, flying in and flying out, or whatever it is. Yeah, or on a rig. And I mean, it's a it's tough. It's a pretty lousy, 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 Yes. Lousy and, and we choices. Look at, Sorry. Yes. No. You know, I mean, that's the point I want to make, that a lot of men's choices aren't real choices. They do it for their families, and that's not a choice. And it's the same choice that women stay home to look after their kids for their families. I mean, we, we make sacrifices for, for other people, and men make them all the time. Absolutely. And those sacrifices should be celebrated and should be highlighted. And if we want to see, you know, the, the narratives that have been kind of going on for the past 30 years, this slow decline in terms of how we perceive masculinity, how we perceive men, uh, identity politics taking such a stronghold on society to the point where we've created two fundamental groups. You're either an oppressor or you're oppressed. And yeah. if you're oppressed, you're a victim, you're fundamentally not responsible for anything in your life. And you will. And by that standard, you see yourself as a perpetual victim. And it's very hard to achieve any kind of real success because you're at the whim of the world at that point. Someone else is responsible for your suffering and you will never have the power until they change. So we've created that narrative on one half and on the other half we've created, you are the oppressor, you are the problem, you need to change. We're even tired of telling you, you need to change. You just have to figure it out and you need to start telling other people within your group how wrong they are. And it's kind of grown to this point where uh, men have been, you know, if the goal was to actually help men to reduce suicide, to, to keep fathers in the house, this narrative has done the exact opposite. It's had the exact opposite effect of what they claim they want to do. And uh, we want to see we want to see better families. We want to see better children growing up. The the biggest problem with children, and this this isn't my opinion. This is you know uh, statistically proven. It's proven through multiple studies. Is a lack of fathers in the home yeah. for young boys. Um, and I lived in in rough neighborhoods, and I saw what was going on. And those kids look for, I lived in Spanish Harlem and, and a lot of the kids in my neighborhoods would join gangs. They don't have a positive father, uh, father figure. And the yeah. gang replaced that. It was a substitute for that. Yeah. Uh, and it was a way to feel like I'm a man, I'm accepted. I can prove my masculinity. I'm now have someone to look up to, someone who rewards me, but it's rewarding you for negative behavior where when we have fathers in the home, a lot of the time we can be rewarded for positive behavior and, yeah. and see what that right path is. Um, yeah, I, so, think, I think this is one of the great tragedies of our time. We've never before encouraged men more to be involved with their children. I mean, they're told from the day that 
the minute the child is born or before the child is born, they have to be there. You know, this is the most important experience for them. And then we are so ready to re- rip the rug out from under them if the woman's had enough of that relationship. And it's yep. just, I've, I've always just thought it's a total outrage. And part of me wants to tell men don't have children. It's t- you, too risky for you. And uh, yeah, that breaks my heart because I think children are the great joy in life. And, and men are, are learning that to be really involved with their children. And yet it's yeah. just a shocking situation they're now in. Uh, well, anyway, social, engineering, yeah. social engineering can go a long way. You know what I mean? It, over decades, it can actually have a strong effect. And it's proven. We've seen the yeah. two-parent house drop from, what was it, in the 60s? Uh, in the African-American community, I believe it was upward of 80 to 85% was a two-parent yeah. household. Now it's as low by some estimates as 15%, 25 yeah. to 15%, I believe. Um, in in uh, the white community, it's significantly dropped by about five times from 5 to 25%. Yeah. I mean, we've been destroying this concept. It's almost like it's considered offensive today to say you believe in... Uh, you know uh, these ideals, and, uh, allowed, and you're he- never allowed to talk about the deficiencies of a sole parent pension, and that's something I've been talking about for decades and getting a huge flack for it. I mean, remember when Obama made a very strong speech about the impact of fatherlessness, and particularly in the black community, and he 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 gave that speech once in you know, early in his presidency, and he never talked about that again that I can see. I mean. The, that we, the feminists have such a grip on our society in controlling the narrative, and they are determined to shut down anyone who who implies that there's anything wrong with a soul bum family. And that's the problem we have. That's yeah, why it's, it's not, research gets suppressed and so on. Well, you know, because they take saying that a child has a better shot at life when he has a, a two-parent household. They take that, that statistical fact, and they say, oh, you're against single mothers. You're trying to put down single mothers. No, I believe single mothers work incredibly hard. They are amazing for what they have to do. They have to work, they have to take care of it. But by definition, it's a harder life. Yeah. And so, and uh, you and know. And it's a what, lesser life, a lesser life for their children. No yes. question. Yeah. And yeah. so, mm-hmm. why is it wrong to try and create those healthy environments for children? I don't yeah. see that it's a, it's a crime to try and, and, and discuss these things and look at the data and say, well, you know, maybe we should stop looking at fathers like they're disposable and that they can just be thrown away and start saying, yeah. no, they need to be in the house. And yeah. uh, there, uh, I can tell you numerous examples. I, I got involved with a group uh, that fights for fathers' rights and uh, they're constantly attacked. And they said it's shocking because the only thing they're fighting for is an equal assumption of custody at the time of a divorce. In other words, that a father be looked at and have equal value to the mother at that time. All else aside, right? We, we're not looking at, is it, you know, is someone an alcoholic, yeah. is someone abusive, yeah, yeah. Someone, just from a, a strictly a, a gender standpoint, does, should, does, um, should a yeah. father have equal value? They don't. And so they've been fighting that this be a law, that we perceive fathers at equal value. They finally got it passed in one state and when they got it passed, there was a feminist group that fought so hard against it that they attached to it, they tagged on, that if there is an accusation of assault, only an accusation, no evidence, no nothing else, from the woman toward the man, that that equal assumption be automatically disregarded. Yeah. And so what does that do? That incentivizes now people to just make an accusation. They don't need evidence. Their word is enough to take away custody rights from the child, from the, from yeah. the father, first child. Uh, you look at suicide rates post-divorce when when fathers lose uh, custody, it's extremely high. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, you know, these things have to change. I think they have yeah. to change uh, not only for the well, father and the mother. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, I mean, people um, watching this will be able to see. I've been writing about this issue and what's happening in Australia in relation to this for a long time. Um, we've just had a significant development in this particular area in, in, in relation to family law. Australia actually led the world for a while in a presumption of equal parental responsibility after divorce. Um, we had a very enlightened Prime Minister a few years ago who was determined to do something about fatherlessness. Uh, and exactly the same thing happened here. But of course, from a national perspective, the feminists used the violence card. They had 
they fought and fought and fought to argue that uh, shared parenting would allow dangerous men to have contact with their children and they managed to get domestic violence laws. I mean, in fact, we have um, violence protection um, orders now being across the board used as a weapon in family court battles, women making false allegations. And that enables them to just totally then determine the outcome in the divorce. If they well, make a, you can have the father removed from the home, you, he doesn't get to see his kids, you get more of the assets. It is the big power ploy in family court. And now we've just, ha just in the last few weeks in Australia, had an announcement of an inquiry into all of this, which I'm very excited about. Anyway, I'll be writing about this on ThinkSpot for who are people who are interested in all of this. But um, Ilan, I want to move on to your video and um, talk about, you were talking about the reaction to that. So I sure. gather you got a lot of flack initially. Okay, well, there was far more, and this is the interesting thing and what I believe the silent majority, like I said, people are scared. I was scared to release the video. Many people wrote in that they're scared to express how they felt about the video. Yeah. Uh, I had psychologists write in, I had uh, doctors write in, I had saying, I'm, I can't express these views. I work in universities and I'm, yeah. I'm scared to you know, say how far I think things have gone. And, I, and a lot of people identify on, on across the board politically. Now, obviously, uh, there was more uh, support from, you know, conservative uh, news, and, and I did receive more emails from those sources. But there was a silent, a uh, very scared, silent group, I believe, that is very left-leaning, that, that feels that this is unhealthy. Yeah. Um, and so they wrote in. We got, I got a lot, a lot of emails of support, far more than I did uh, emails of hate. Obviously, the emails of hate... and. It's very hard to debate when someone's position from the starting point uh, yeah. is to vilify you to that extent. Um, but you look, you look at the statistics now, I was looking at them this week. So the Gillette ad has 32 million views, 32 million views, it's extraordinary. But if you look at the lie, it was one and a half million uh, dislikes, one, no, one, yeah, 1 1.5 million dislikes and 800 likes. So. You know, the number of people hating that video far outweighed the number liking it. But with your video, I mean, I think it's doing pretty well. Four point, I think it was four point five million. This was the latest. Four point six, yeah, I think. Four point six, yeah. and uh, and uh, what is it? Five hundred thousand likes and only um, nine thousand dislikes. So that's pretty good. You're doing very well. That, and that's what really counts. What are people? you know, people who are watching it, how they're reacting to it, rather than the people who actually write letters to you. I mean, it gives you a much better indication of how people are reacting, doesn't it? Well, that that's the interesting thing. The people who are yeah. vocal, uh, yeah. you know, tend to, that, and that's who's controlling the narrative right now. It's yeah. just, it's a bunch of people screaming, and, yeah. and you have the whole world thinking that's the majority view, that's who we have to appease, that's who our money comes from. Um, I didn't do the video for money at all. That wasn't my intention. I was just fed up. Uh, and I actually was, I thought that two things would happen when I released the video. Either it would just kind of disappear and into the internet like most videos do, or if it did get big, that it would damage my company. And I was ready to kind of fight and say, well, I don't care. This is what I believe in. Um, I didn't, because I was kind of a sucker for that too at the time, for that vocal majority who... Uh, who kind of just yells, I was like, oh, maybe they do represent a huge percentage of the population and, and they're going to come down on me and they're going to ruin my life, my livelihood, my, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, it's it's scary to just kind of say anything positive about masculinity yeah. is scary nowadays, um, which is insane to me. But uh, regardless, that's where I was at. And it was very nice, yeah, to see kind of how how many positive responses there were, how many people rather like a video like that than dislike it. Um, is enough to kind of show, no, there's a lot more people who believe what we believe, uh, yeah. at least on some fundamental level that it's the pendulum has swung too far. Yeah, and look at the Gillette uh, outcome. Wonderful news that they lost $8 billion, mm -hmm. uh, presumably as a result of making this really stupid decision um, to produce an ad that offended most of their potential buying um, group. Um, now, what about you? Have you sold more watches? That's what I want to know. <laughs> there was definitely an uptick up there. We sold out of the watches on our website. Um, 
there's, there's only so many. I think know. I should be encouraging everybody to, to support Egar Watchers. I think we'll put a little ad at the end of this video to make sure they do. Because what is really important to me about what you did is you didn't just make this as an individual. You chose to take the risk of putting your company out there backing it. And that must have been a really big decision for you. That, that was the tough decision. I didn't sleep that entire night uh, when I did it. And my father was really, I had to talk with my dad and uh, I had a, like a real discussion with him. I'm like, do I want to do a video like this? And, and, and say it's a response to Gillette because that was part of it, kind of saying enough is enough. And uh, he told me, he's like, you know what? I trust you, I trust your instinct. You've, you've always kind of done what you believe in. Uh, and it's it's who you are. That's that's yeah. who you are. That message is is who you are. You made it. Uh, put it out. Go for it. And I was yeah. like, okay. Uh, but I had a lot of friends. I had friends who were uh, producers for for films in Hollywood who reached out to me and said, I just showed it to them. I said, what do you think about this? Initially, I didn't think it was so controversial until I started getting the feedback. When I first made the video, I was just kind of frustrated, and I I wanted to say, no, let's do something positive. Let's take it, something that I see as negative and see if I can make it a positive. And then I showed it to some friends who. You know, I work out here and do things out here, and they were like, "Ah, oh, bad idea. You're gonna get a lot of backlash for this bad idea." Everyone kept telling me, and so it convinced me on a deep level that there was something controversial in that ad. Um, and so that's where the fear came from. Uh, so, yeah. Yes. But but what's interesting also, you you commented on the fact that you you got a lot of comment positive response from women. I mean, people always assume, yeah, yeah, you'll get men supporting this stuff, but the women hate it. And in fact, I mean, what I find everywhere is I'm getting more and more women backing what I'm doing here. Uh, and you had that too. Huh? Over 50% were yeah. women writing in. Women who, and it's interesting, women writing in, oh, I'm worried about my son and what you yeah. did, you know, kind of celebrates the type of man he can be. And I want him to watch that so that he can, uh, you know, see what what he can, you know, grow up. And it's, it's being a man isn't a negative. And, uh, but I also had for husbands, I had women who were just looking, saying that, you know, how hard it's become to meet somebody because men don't even know how to act anymore. Yeah. Uh, and so a lot of women who were single just reached out and told me like this, this helps that, that, that they wanted. Yeah. But so many mothers were scared for their boys. Mothers scared. Yeah. Um, Mo mothers of sons particularly, I just don't know what to do with what's happening to our culture. Um, and, what, yeah. I, what, I, I was just wondering what, what I think of it. One of the things I really liked was a comment under your your YouTube video. The, one of the first comments say, "I started shaving with egg, egg art watches," which I thought was <laughs> adorable. So that's sweet. Yeah, um, funny. Um, anyway, how has this all changed you? I noticed you've made another video since then called "Letter to My Son." So I, I mean, I assume it means you've really taken the red pill now. You're you're really willing to. Um, push this all a bit further, is that right? Yeah, I got involved with that that organization uh, that uh, is fighting for that equal assumption yeah. and on the fathers. Um, and I, I also give them a lot of advice on how to approach the kind of narrative because they've been so vilified, sadly. Uh, because what, what are they called? You know, the, the, they're from, from Canada. They're the Fathers' Rights Movement in Canada. Okay. Uh, and we'll, so, we'll, we'll, put, we'll put some information up about that as I'll well. I'll send you all the details for them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and I also got involved with uh, with someone called Neil Duffy from Good Men in Sports. And uh, I, he's doing some really good stuff because uh, his whole goal is also, again, to show positive kind of – these men become so famous, these football players, boxers, whatever they are. And, uh, you know, a lot of them can do so much good with that. And so this is kind of just to push them in the right path to say, like, use that as a, a tool to kind of – celebrate what you've accomplished, but also to kind of become a, uh, an example for other people in the sport, uh, yeah, for so how to be a great man. Um, and I so think getting, getting men, men involved is a really interesting idea. We've had a, another ex big bit of excitement in Australia in the last few weeks, which is the demise of a big domestic violence organization called White Ribbon. And this organization was all about men standing up against violence against women, which sounds like a laudable goal, but it was actually a virtue signaling organization, which really was all was essentially about shaming men. They went into schools and taught little bo little girls to be afraid of little boys. They had the little boys standing up renouncing their violence in classrooms. They went into workplace and, and promoted a lot of misleading statistics. 
you know, imply that only men are violent. Anyway, this whole organisation has grossly overspent the vast amounts of government money they were given. And they've gone broke, which we all just absolutely celebrating. Um, but it makes us think we, you know, this idea of harnessing good men and getting them on board, um, working for genuine equality to men and women, for men and women is a really important thing. And there are other ways we can do that rather than that sort of what was really a very destructive narrative. Um, no, but let's go back to that video. Sure, Ilan, sorry, the, the letter, to, letter, letter to my son. I was scared before I met you. But the moment I saw you for the first time, I knew. I knew it was game over. I would love you forever. I knew I would stand by your side no matter what. I knew that I would give up everything to make your life better. I knew that every moment of pain for you would be a moment of pain for me. I knew I would be your guide, your example, your standard in this world for what it means to be a man. See, but what I didn't know was just how much this world would test us. I didn't know how strong you were. I didn't know how I needed you just as much as you needed me. That was essentially about a very important message about fathering. Yes. Yeah. Um, and that was that was very much uh, kind of me honoring again the relationship I have with my father. Yeah. Um, and kind of my goal with that video, and I, ha you know, I believe it actually hurt a couple of my friends who grew up without fathers or grew up in, in tough situations. They watched it and they're like, man, this is what I wish I would have had. I had a friend call yeah. me up crying. And he's like, it's, it's a beautiful video, but it hurts. Um, so my goal with that video was just kind of, again, to show how strong that bond can be. It can save, save your life. I know for me, it's it, in many ways saved my life. Uh, just because when I was going through those health issues, I hit rock bottom. I was in pain all the time. And if you don't have guidance or a little bit of hope at the right time you could lose everything and we don't realize how easy those small things those small things they matter so much we take them for granted yeah um, and so and what about you are you you're in a long-term relationship are you wanting to have children yeah I'm finally getting a little better for my health issues and uh, that is my goal uh, I you know I I, I was working like crazy and again I, I was telling myself when I'm gonna be a dad I want to be uh, I want to be ready and I want to be a great father. Uh, and uh, so my main thing was really getting past the health issues, which were really bring me down for many years. Okay. Um, well, I, I hope it happens for you. Because I, uh, as I said, I think it's one of the, the great joys of life. And one of the, I, and I hope you have a son, I must say. I mean, I, obviously, it doesn't matter what you have, but it's, I still think it's an important thing that men enjoy being fathers to son. One of, the, one of the things that really depressed me was looking at some research last year, which talked about the fact that um, parents to be, fathers to be, no longer want to first have a son. They say they'd rather have a daughter. And that to me is all about what we've done to men, that we that men are nervous of raising sons now. They think it's easier to have a daughter, which I think in many ways it is, because we have a very anti-male culture. Um, but I'm very much hoping for you, that you have the, you obviously really value that father to son relationship, and I hope it happens for you. Thank you. Yeah, I actually, it's so fascinating because you, one week ago, before we talked about any of this stuff, I had seen an article uh, that was posted saying more more men and women in society want to have little girls now than boys for the first yeah. time, ever, and they were celebrating it as if it's an achievement. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, it's not an achievement one way or another, right? If people want to have boys or want to have girls, it's, it's, what you want to have should be a natural kind of process of your life, your development. It shouldn't be motivated by social engineering. So that's very creepy to me that that's kind of what they were yeah. celebrating. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, you know, to be nervous of boys is a really worrying thing. And to not, you know, not celebrate the special things about a father-son relationship or a mother-son relationship. 
and to think it's always better to <laughs> anyway where's that all heading and what about where are you heading Elon? what in more videos what do you think you're going to do now I mean, there's a, there's a lot of subjects in recent years that are tied to this very much about tied to identity politics, try, tied to kind of how we perceive men, tied to this whole concept of engineering and results. You, uh, all, I want to talk about all these things. I want to try and affect positive change. If I one day have a platform, that's what I kind of uh, I hope happens. I want to help these organizations I'm working with. Um, I'm happy w w with my company, but, you know, I really care about these things. And, I, you know, I there's this emphasis on on equality of outcome over equality of opportunity yeah. uh, especially in relation to men and women has made women miserable when did we redefine happiness as being purely successful from a monetary standpoint as if that's what everyone's happiness has to be and hammer yeah. that into women like it, you're not a you're not successful unless you're the ceo of a company no you're also successful if you're a mother who takes care of her kids and is a wonderful mother uh, that's just as valuable to society if not more valuable uh, so there's been this weird shift. Uh, it's not to say that women shouldn't be CEOs or can't be CEOs, but we can't disregard and suddenly say this is what they have to be. Uh, and so well, there's a lot. Well, one of the things on that on that point, you know, there was an, a, a sort of assumption in our society years ago that you know the idea that men don't on their deathbed think about I should have spent more time in their office, and we knew that men regret often went through their whole lives regretting that they devoted so much time to their careers, their jobs, and didn't spend enough time, as much time as they should with their children in the, and in their relationships. Yep. And what do we do? We then teach women to do exactly the same thing. I mean, it's just yes. madness. And not to value the really important thing that women used to know, that relationships are everything. That relationships with having bringing up children is a fabulous thing. You know, I once was invited into my daughter's school on a careers night and I talked about don't forget to have babies <laughs> and the careers advisor actually was really positive she wasn't expecting that but she yeah. said thank, go thank goodness someone is saying that the careers aren't everything because no one dares talk about that anymore no. and I've, I've had the most wonderful career uh, but I always say the most important thing in my life are my relationships with my kids so there you are well uh, Elan, it's been so nice talking to you today um, as well. I hope maybe we can talk again. I'm very excited that you, I didn't realize that you had such a passion for these issues. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And I hope we'll see you appearing again, broadcasting, you know, really important issues that need more public discussion and need brave people like you willing to get out there and say them. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's, a, it's been a real pleasure uh, like, talking with you, honestly. Okay. All right. We'll talk again. Thanks, Elo. Thank you. everybody for supporting me on my YouTube channel. I've got growing numbers of subscribers which is really exciting. If you'd like to support me financially, go to my donate page on my website. Thanks a lot.